like all of you, wrote Michelle Obama in the aftermath of Wednesday's events. I watched as a gang, organized, violent, and mad, they'd lost an election. They'd sieged the United States Capitol. They set up gallows. They proudly waved the traitorous flag of the Confederacy through the halls. They desecrated the center of American government. And once authorities finally gained control of the situation, these rioters and gang members were led out of the building, not in handcuffs, but free to carry on with their days. The day was a fulfillment of the wishes of an infantile and unpatriotic president who can't handle the truth of his own failures. And the wreckage lays at the feet of a party and media apparatus that gleefully cheered him on, knowing full well the possibility of consequences like these. It all left me with so many questions, she went on. Questions about the future, questions about security, extremism, propaganda, and more. But there's one question I just can't shake. What if these rioters had looked like the folks who go to Ebenezer Baptist Church every Sunday? Obama was reflecting on her own emotional slide that day from joy and pride at Raphael Warnock's victory to the terroristic incursion we all witnessed. The question was rhetorical. She knew the answer. We know the answer. This summer's Black Lives Matter protests, she continued, were an overwhelmingly peaceful movement, our nation's largest demonstrations ever, bringing together people of every race and class and encouraging millions to re-examine their own assumptions and behavior, and yet, in city after city, day after day, we saw peaceful protesters met with brute force. We saw cracked skulls and mass arrests. Law enforcement pepper spraying its way through a peaceful demonstration for a presidential photo op. However, a part of me wants to simply read the rest of Michelle Obama's words or Merrick Garland's words, or Biden's, Pelosi's, Romney's, or even, dare I say, Lindsey Graham's. But you can read their speeches or listen to them on YouTube. Many of you already have. I wish instead to share our Torah's words, because I also think this week's parasha has some ancient wisdom for us to consider here. After the Torah reminds us of the 70 souls who ventured down to Egypt to begin a new life, we read, Vayakom melech hadash al mitzrayim, asher lo yadat Yosef. A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. The 12th century French Tosephus Bechor Shor explains, Lo hikiro velo yado velo nasala hem panim bishvilo. He didn't recognize him, he didn't know him, and he didn't tolerate or pay any attention to the Hebrews on his behalf. This scene is exactly what it seems to be. The old king died, a new king arose. That new king no longer had any meaningful relationship with Joseph, nor any Hebrews, hence his draconian policies against them. But what if the text is not entirely clear on this point. Hamek Davar, the 19th century Lithuanian commentator, says this new pharaoh was not necessarily a different king, but one instead who had new views. The problem was that pharaoh didn't bother to focus on Joseph's work to better Egyptian society. It's from this willful ignorance his suspicions were born. Pharaoh not new Pharaoh, but same Pharaoh, makes a choice after Joseph's death. My kingdom is secure. The famine has been vanquished. I no longer need these Hebrews who have grown in numbers. He makes a choice to look at them in a new light, in a darker and more sinister way. I must say, I was appalled by the hypocrisy on display in the halls of Congress this week by lawmakers who have enabled and provided cover for this dangerous demagogue for years until it's no longer politically expedient to do so. Have some of them had a true change of heart? Maybe. That's between them and their conscience or their God. 
but words and actions matter. And the vile racism, anti-Semitism, and violence on display Wednesday was a direct manifestation of Donald Trump's insidious approach to governance and the many, many public servants who were either used by him or who used him to serve first and foremost their own interests over that of the Constitution and the people. The essence of the rule of law, said Merrick Garland, nominee for attorney general, judge, former Supreme Court candidate, shul attending Jew, grandson of immigrants who grew up miles from my home in the Chicago suburb and at whose high school auditorium I attended high holy day services each year. The essence of the rule of law, he said, is that like cases are treated alike, that there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, one rule for friends and another for foes, one rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich and another for the poor, or different rules depending on one's race or ethnicity. The essence of its great corollary, equal justice under law, is that all citizens are protected in the exercise of their civil rights. This week was a powerful and sickening demonstration of what happens when Pharaoh, when governmental authorities do not know Joseph. Now to be clear, I'm not trying to draw a parallel between an Egyptian transition of power and this American one. I'm more interested in the result of objectification of people and weaponization of language and ideas. Biden isn't a new king. Trump isn't the old one. This is a democracy. After all, the president works for us. I want to argue that the new king is actually not a new king at all, but rather a metaphor for the sovereignty of hate when it trumps the dominion of love. This notion that this isn't about a new king, but rather a new way of looking at the world or the potential toxicity of ideas is, I think, what Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, the Ha'amek Davar, is getting at. But it's also derived from a Talmudic debate. In Masachet, Masachet Eruvin, we read, Rav and Shmuel, that is, two Babylonian scholars, disagreed. One said, he was actually a new king, and one said he was in fact the old king, but his decrees were new. The case for Pharaoh being a different person is pretty clear. The text reads, Melech Hadash, new king. But what about Shmuel's case, that he was the same king with new, prop new policies? Typically in Tanakh, in the Bible, we're told when a king dies, including foreign kings. For example, in the description of Edomite kings, and their succession, we read Vayamot Bela, Vayamot Yovav, Vayamot Husham, Bela died, then Yovav succeeded him, Yovav died, then Husham succeeded him, and so on and so forth. But here, with regard to Pharaoh, it doesn't say anything about his death. In fact, it does tell us about the death of Pharaoh a little bit later in our Parsha, when it specifically tells us that Pharaoh died and a new Pharaoh came and the situation for the Hebrews got worse. So maybe that was the new king, not a third king. And maybe this moment is actually about a shift of a different kind. According to Shmuel, therefore, the text is open to interpretation. But the Gemara asks a question. And according to the one who said that his decrees are new, isn't it written who did not know Joseph? If it were the same king, how could he not know Joseph? The Gemara explains what is the meaning of the phrase who knew not Joseph? It means that he conducted himself like one who did not know Joseph at all. It boils down, friends, to the choices that people make. It's much more interesting, I think, much more relevant, if Torah is teaching us not about the limitation of human record keeping from one administration to the next, but about the capacity for humans to marginalize, stereotype, and scapegoat. How can we possibly understand an American flag 
flying and then taken down and replaced with a Trump flag, a Confederate black banner desecrating the Capitol Rotunda. How to comprehend a rioter who can in one breath shout blue lives matter, but F the blue when those police officers are trying to uphold a law inconvenient to that particular rioter. And how do we make sense of the double standard with which police regularly treat white Americans versus black Americans or Near Eastern Americans and South Asian Americans? What does our Parsha tell us about Pharaoh's purported justification for enslavement of the Hebrew people? Vayomer el Amo, and he said to his people. Notice his people who are not those people. Hine, am b'nei Yisrael, rava atzum mimenu. Look, the Israelite people are much too numerous for us. Let us deal shrewdly with them so that they may not increase. Otherwise, in the event of war, they may join our enemies in fighting against us and rise from the ground. Folks, there is zero indication in the text that b'nei Yisrael are rebellious that they are organized against the crown. What is the crime for which they lose their freedom and acceptance in society? They're fertile, which is to say they exist. And they exist in a way Pharaoh can't easily ignore. This is the timeless hallmark of the bigot. Those people, this people, that people, if they are of use to me, if I can benefit from their connections, their policy advice, perhaps some of their wealth if they have it, if I can tolerate them, or rather I can tolerate them if those things, and if they have music or art or humor that makes my life more enjoyable, I'll consume their music, art, and comedy. If they appear really useful, Maybe I'll even break bread with them, embrace them publicly. But when they are no longer of use, they are no longer of interest. And then so long as they stay where I don't have to see them, don't have to listen to them, or God forbid, have to get to know them, I can tolerate them. But not in my neighborhood, not in my country club, my church, my synagogue, not in my White House, and not in my Capitol building. This willful ignorance, this recalcitrance of knowing is a toxin for any heterogeneous society. So perhaps that's why the term yada is used here to indicate that he didn't know Joseph. Guess what? There's another word for knowledge of a person that's more frequently used. He care to recognize. If I say to you, I know this person or that, I would say, Ani makir et ploni. That guy is familiar to me. He and I are buddies. But the word yada is reserved for a different sort of knowing, sometimes sexual, but not necessarily. It's a more intimate expression of knowing. This verse marks the first instance of the verb yada in the entire book of Exodus, but it gets used many more times over the next several chapters. The commentary in Eitz Chaim suggests this might anticipate chapter nine, when Moses says to Pharaoh, as I go out of the city, I shall spread my hands to the Lord, the thunder will cease, the hail will fall no more, so that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. Laman teda ki ladonai haaretz. You, Pharaoh, the text seems to claim, refuse to know this people, a group of human beings deserving of dignity and access to basic civil rights, but oh, you will know, because you will know me, and by then it will be too late. What to do with all of this? We don't live in a world where God will dole out punishment to those who have behaved badly nor would I wish to live in such a world. One thing we can do is to learn from the myriad mistakes of this administration and to insist on representative government that represents all Americans. We can seek comfort in future generations who will hopefully make fewer mistakes than ours. 
my own daughter, Ellie, wrote a beautiful piece that I posted on Facebook. She said, I fear for my future, my freedom, and my life. But even though I am afraid, I remember the words of Nelson Mandela. I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. And we can turn to our tradition, our sacred texts, the story, the cautionary tale of a king who refused to know a people, and a people who refused to be defeated. It is our, in our resilience I place my faith. The resilience of my people who have survived and thrived for thousands of years against great odds, against the likes of those who would wear a Camp Auschwitz hoodie to the Capitol building. And the resist, resilience of a republic that despite its many failings appears capable of surviving an insurrection of grave proportions. As we say each week in the prayer for our country, pour out your blessing upon this land, upon its inhabitants, upon its leaders, its judges, officers, and officials who faithfully devote themselves to the needs of the public. Help them understand the rules of justice you have decreed so that peace and security, happiness and freedom will never depart from our land. Implicit in these words is, of course, a rebuke. If they do not devote themselves to our true collective needs, if they refuse to understand, may their efforts be frustrated, may they falter, and may they fail. And may others who wish to know, who strive to comprehend, who brandish not weapons, but their capacity for empathy in the public square, and insist on a more just tomorrow, may they inherit the mantle of leadership. Uproot from our hearts, says the prayer, hatred and malice, jealousy and strife. Plant love and companionship, peace and friendship among the many peoples and faiths who dwell in our nation. To that I am confident. God also can say amen. Hevra, I want to invite you at this time to stand in your homes with us here at Beth Am for the prayer for our country on page 177. Let's read the words together today, all of them. Our God and God of our ancestors, with mercy accept our prayer on behalf of our country and its government. Pour out your blessing upon this land, upon its inhabitants, upon its leaders, its judges, officers, and officials who faithfully devote themselves to the needs of the public. Help them understand the rules of justice you have decreed, so that peace and security, happiness and freedom will never depart from our land. Adonai, God, whose spirit is in all creatures, we pray that your spirit be awakened within all the inhabitants of our land. Uproot from our hearts hatred and malice, jealousy and strife. Plant love and companionship, peace and friendship among the many peoples and faiths who dwell in our nation. Grant us the knowledge to judge justly, the wisdom to act with compassion, and the understanding and courage to root out poverty from our land. May it be your will that our land be a blessing to all who dwell on earth, and may you cause all peoples to dwell in friendship and freedom. Speedily fulfill the vision of your prophets. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall they learn war anymore. For all of them, from the least of them to the greatest, shall know me and let us say.